by Alessandro Bizzatri, and with 15 contributions by altogether 22 authors. I'm Jens Lerge from SOAS, uh, University of London, and I'll be chairing the Zoom launch of this very beautiful book. And by beautiful, I don't just mean that it has a very beautiful cover, which it has. Uh, I must say that it's a pleasure to celebrate this book. It's also beautiful because it adds something new to Marx's status as we know it, as an eminent thinker and political activist. We can now, with this book, add a field and a fieldwork ang angle to him, as this volume brings Marx to the field. Many, many of the authors present today, as well as others, have um, taken him there already in one way or the other. But this book is a collective endeavor that does so in a much more systemic and considerate manner. And herein lies its significance. To outline that uh, and in what ways it does so, I will shortly hand over to Alessandra to introduce the volume. After that, a fair few of the other 22 distinguished contributors to the book will discuss their chapters along the lines of three themes that are central to the book. And this will then take us to a question and answer session and provide a discussion. The plan is to wrap it all up around five or at least not much after five. <clears throat> Please, before we start, let me highlight a, a few guidelines. Uh, do switch your microphone off. Um, feel free to write questions and comments in the chat at any point in time. And in addition to that, in the question and answer session, you can ask live questions as well. And of course, when asking a question or making a comment, please be considerate and respectful. That is all I, I, I wish to say by way of introduction. And it is now time to welcome uh, Alessandra Mezatri. I will not introduce each of these speakers because that would take up five minutes in, its, in itself. So, so we will just go straight to the, to the speakers. So over to you, Alessandra. Thank you, Jens. And uh, I'll try now to share my screen as a fully power depend, PowerPoint dependent person, but for very uh, little time. So um, really for me, this is a moment of uh, great uh, happiness because uh, it's a completion of a book that has been my dream uh, to put together for a very long time, which in a sense is a celebration of, uh, well, first of all the people from whom I actually learned along the years, and this involved both uh, academics as well as uh, uh, students. And in fact, the first time that I actually well, used the expression marks in the field was uh, in uh, a student-led workshop in uh, Ghent University, where we actually had some discussions around the book uh, uh, last week with Adam Hanie and, and Figi. Um, so to what I want to do in my five minutes we shall all be very sort of disciplined given uh, the uh, great crowd we have, is to sort of give you some insights into the project, how we came about. And uh, this project was uh, basically a scaled up project from an original uh, uh, commission paper that I wrote for a conference that was Marx at 2000 held in Patna in 2018, where I wrote what has become my contribution into the book, which is Marx in the Sweatshop. Well, I try to make a very strong case on the empirical relevance of Marxian categories and concept as a, a, a fundamental guide to uh, conducting field-based research uh, in a uh, given context. So then I scaled up uh, that uh, uh, project, uh, um, especially based on the fact that uh, all the contributions that were coming for the bicentenary of uh, Marx were mostly instead theory uh, 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 sort of framed, many of them great, but you know, as a field worker, I felt that we could make uh, this uh, uh, contribution here. So I put together a dream team. Some of you, when I first approached you, you actually also were wondering if this was an entirely crazy project. So I really thank you all for instead having stuck with me and all my million emails. Well, actually, I'm not gonna introduce you all because the majority of you, um, in fact, uh, uh, do not even need introductions, but I will just say, 
uh, all the names that are part of the book because uh, it's only thanks to the team that the book is actually here. So uh, Henry Bernstein, Barbara Ellis White, uh, Mohamed Ali Jan, uh, Adam Hanie, who I'm not sure is gonna be with us today, Susan Newman, uh, same, but you can catch her with us again for the DSA conference, uh, Benjamin Selwyn, Satoshi Miyamura, Farah Intero, Brittany Bunce, Ben Cousins, Alex Dubb, and Donna Horn, uh, Hornby, uh, Lorena Lombardozzi, Tania Tofanin, Sara Stevano, this is the Italian feminist contingent, um, Sigrid Bertolman, and uh, then uh, uh, Kevin Capps, uh, Paolo Novak, and Genevieve Le Baron, uh, and Subir Stinha. So I really want to thank all my contributors because they really uh, made the book. Mm -hmm. Now, um, the, um, what, what is the field in this book? The field in this book uh, is uh, uh, a methodological field. So what I try to convince the readers of is, uh, 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 you know, how Marxian categories and concepts are fundamental for the study of the global development process. And so in a sense, the, the field is not a geographical area as in mainstream development studies, but it's much more than that. In fact, it's an attempt to also globalize the discipline. Um, and I think, uh, uh, to move it beyond is more traditional focus on poorer classes uh, and only on the global south, which, if you want, is also sort of suffers from uh, a neo-colonial uh, uh, sort of uh, orientalist gaze. So this is instead an attempt to actually show how given insights from Marxian political economy are crucial to globalize the discipline as well. So that some contributions you will see focus on classics in development studies uh, and development economics and in political economy, like the informal economy and so on and so forth, but others instead focus on accumulators and globalized circuits of accumulation or price formation. Now, the uh, Marx can be brought to the field in many different ways, so I don't claim to cover all of this, but in the book I highlight three of these ways, and uh, my contributors and interlocutors uh, have actually been uh, probed with the task uh, to try to show, uh, well, in many cases, all of the three uh, uh, lands of uh, inquiry, and uh, uh, sort of this is how the conversation will then be sort of organized. Uh, so a first way to bring Mark to the field productively is to stress how Marxian categories uh, and tropes are fundamental for the study of the field. Field. And within this category, even my own contribution would happily fit. Um, the second is an adaptation of categories for the field. So how we take Marxian categories, but necessarily we have to do a process of mediation once we try to uh, deploy them in field context. And the third instead relates uh, to methods. And here I'm hopeful that we'll try to flesh out the different takes that we all have on this issue. If there are indeed uh, some methods that are more Marxian than others, or instead uh, if uh, we can Marxize many different methods in different ways. So if that is all from me, and I'll give back uh, the uh, baton to Jens for organizing then the uh, rest of the book launch with all the contributors along these three lines, uh, these three streams of inquiry. Thank you. Thanks, Alessandra. That was a, a very clear and very brief overview, which is excellent. Now, uh, as you say, the, the, the contributors to the book uh, that are present will now highlight how their chapters contribute to these different three axes. And, and we've asked them already to do so very briefly uh, within five minute presentations at most. Um, now, after that, we'll take comments from the contributors on the political impact of what they've dealt with in their papers and the book project in general. After all, Marx was not a taxonomist. He, was, he had very clear, uh, had very clear purpose with it all, and that was to change the world. So, so that would be good to return to, to that as well after, after this going, going through the, the various uh, aspects. And, and this will also be the point in that discussion afterwards where the contributors can pop in with any further brief comments, for example, on the two themes that they didn't deal with in their first presentation. Um, and uh, this is also where we open up the debate for all the participants uh, of this Zoom book launch. Um, so with uh, no further ado, just to repeat, uh, 
the three axes, the three groups of presentations we have that relates to which concept categories, how to adopt them, and which methods to use. In the, in the first group, uh, which is about which concept and categories using Marx, Marx's conceptual categories, concepts, and framework in the field, we have Henry Bernstein, Barbara Harris White, and Subir Sinha. And in case Adam Hanier can make it, we will have him as well. Uh, Susan uh, Newman, in case she can make it as well, but it, it doesn't look as if she will. So uh, I will. I will suggest that you present in the order that I've been given here. So I'll ask Henry to first give us a five minutes presentation. Henry, over to you. Okay, thank you, Jens. Uh, I'll keep this fairly short because I haven't read the whole book yet, although I certainly intend to. I only got it last week. Um, but first of all, I want to use or abuse this position of speaking first by congratulating Alessandra on the conception of the book as a project, those she was able to recruit, I think it's enormously important. It's enormously timely, as well as being imaginative. Now, having said that, and finding myself in a position in the book immediately after Alessandra's introduction, uh, and looking at the titles of the other chapters and those who have written them, um, I end up with the feeling that I'm probably more of an orthodox Marxist than many of the other contributors to the book. Now, I say that without any judgment whatsoever. Um, it may have some strengths, it certainly has some weaknesses. And well, what I tried to do in my piece, which really drew on things I've been thinking about for some time, is to emphasize, which I think is in the spirit of the book and, and Alessandra's conception of it, is to emphasize the empirical. And I think that's really what the book is about, is it's about encouraging people who have ideas, positions that are at least open to Marxism to learn about how to go about doing solid empirical research and not so much historical as in today's worlds of capitalism. I try to deal mostly in passing given limitations of space and my own capacities, uh, some quite difficult issues which do exist. And one of them, um, which I think Alessandra mentions in the introduction is Marx's notion of the essential and the phenomenal. Now, in a sense, all we can study is the phenomenal. On one hand, I think that if we study the phenomenal without any conception of essential relations and dynamics that uh, underlie and generate the massive variety and expanse of uh, phenomenal forms of capitalism, then we are in danger of slipping into an empiricist position. And although we must be serious empirically, and I suggest ways in which that can happen, uh, I don't think Marxists can be empiricists in the usual philosophical sense. On the other hand, there is a long history within Marxism of not grasping the empirical, the phenomenal, with sufficient understanding and sufficient um, sharpness. Phenomenal forms are the ways in which people experience capitalism, however deeply, uh, you know, wherever they are located within capitalist social relations uh, and formations. So phenomenal forms have their own effectivity. And I think that is especially true um, among other things, in relation to how capitalism ex is experienced. I won't say much more, except I will emphasize for the uh, benefit or otherwise of comrades present, that I am very skeptical that there is any empirical method which is specific to or peculiar 
to Marxism. I think that tests of empirical thoroughness, plausibility, uh, and so on and so forth, coherence must be the same tests as are applied throughout social science um, at its best. So that is um, a position I try to explain and to illustrate um, in my uh, contribution uh, to Alessandro's book. So Marxists, and because of all the opposition they face intellectually and politically, have to be as good empirically as they can be. And there is masses of material, empirical material in Marx's writings. Mm-hmm. And he used whatever he could find that he thought would be useful and would be developing and illuminating his own ideas. So, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. all right, from the factory reports, as we know, to newspaper uh, accounts of contemporary political events elsewhere. I'm stopping, Jens. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Henry, for, for this uh, uh, brief introduction to some of the basic aspects of, 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 of Marxian engagement with, uh, with, with, with the empirical realities or other realities. Um, and also with that sting in the tail uh, that may, we may come back to later, uh, of whether there is a, a Marxist uh, uh, method. Um, now, um, I will uh, go straight on to Barbara Harris-White. Thank you, Jens. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Right. Um, I'm very tired and reeling from being the opponent in a Swedish PhD exam. Um, From that, um, it's been made clear to me that we live in an era of a thousand flowers and a load of proliferating subfields. There are proliferations of terms of art, which are intelligible only to a few. There are proliferations of technique and data, which are also intelligible to a few masters of the universe. And there's a proliferation of fuzzy terms, which are um, intelligible to many people, but only because there are many meanings. Um, So that uh, from this um, Uh, experience of being an opponent, um, I feel it's really important to return to grand theorists for their clear definitions and theories um, that have been of paramount importance for us to understand our neoliberal world which pulsates pulsates with markets. So I want to say firstly bravo to Alessandra for putting this together Um, and who better than to return to Marx. Um, My chapter is about markets, it's about merchants capital and commercial capital, and it's a journey of discovery. It's one that if you conduct the same journey would be repeated for other awkward classes in Marx like middle classes and petty commodity production, and also as John Bellamy Foster and Corhe Saito have shown um, other concepts which are now terribly important like the metabolic rift. So the chapter is um, uh, about markets and markets are the theater for Marx, for merchants capital, which is capital used for buying and selling um, of paramount importance to our world. Um, And it's contrast with commercial capital, which um, for the uh, uninitiated ought to be actually existing merchants capital. But the first surprise when you go to Marx is that he interchanges merchants capital and commercial capital. And he also adds many other synonyms. He calls commercial capitalists, dealers, shopkeepers, even traffickers, and he refers to hybrid forms and he's not always very nice about them. So the second surprise is that even though he has um, critical things to say about merchants and commercial capital, he also respects their role. Um, as necessary to the reproduction of society. He also argues very clearly that it's necessary for them to be efficient and it's necessary for the money capital tied up in markets, which is used for buying and selling and the other kind of money capital that's used for money advances to be efficient at every stage. So whereas some people draw a big contrast between a Marxian approach to uh, markets 
and a land grant approach to market efficiency, when you start studying Marx, you find that he allows for the need for markets to be efficient in order to save social resources. The third surprise that you get is that Marx makes the strong case that merchants and commercial capital is necessary to social reproduction, but that it's not productive because in buying and selling, um, a product doesn't, or a commodity doesn't change its nature and it doesn't change its use value. However, at the same time, Marx sees traders as what he calls productive consumers who add use value at every stage of the system of uh, circulation of what we know as markets. And how can, how can this be? This uh, happens because in actually existing markets, productive activity meshes with buying and selling, the archetypical activity of merchants' capital. And this happens between firms in what Marx sees in a contemporary way as a value chain, um, and also within firms in different kinds of activity com combinations. So not only do we get surprises in Marx about the essential concepts that he wants to deploy, um, but we also get some contradictions. And it Time, I want to look very briefly at three of them which are in my chapter. Sorry? Okay. Um, firstly, as an example of productive activity in the sphere of circulation, he takes transport. Um, he sees transport as changing the place of a commodity, and he describes it in two ways. Firstly, it appropriates um, the use value created in production. And secondly, he almost contradicts himself by saying that it's a branch of industry um, penetrating the sphere of circulation. And he does something rather similar with labor. Um, so he's actually in his work willing to face the fact that in defining the concept and its role, there are sometimes contradictions. On a general scale, he argues that merchants' capital, commercial capital, increases commodity production, capitalist relations, centralization, concentration, all that we know, expanded reproduction, specialization. However, he also argues that it depends on pre-capitalist labor relations, and he sees merchants' capital as an obstacle to industrial capitalism. We all know that he says at best it's a passive win. You're already over, you're already on six, seven minutes, so could you please uh, wind up? No, it's, 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 it's a pain. Well, anyway, you get, there's much more to say. Yeah. You get the message that examining the theoretical concepts in Marx, in Marx is something of a knockabout, and I'll leave it there. Thank you, Barbara. And uh, of course, yes, what can I say? We have all followed your, your, your development of the way you have developed the categories uh, with, with, with pleasure and interest and, and use them over the years. Excellent. Um, now, could, could I just remind everyone of, of, of being muted, except when they're actually meant to talk. Um, uh, and with that comment, I will uh, go on to Subia Sinha, the third of, uh, of the presenters in, uh, that we know are here for this group. Subia, over to you. Uh, thanks very much, Jens. Uh, thanks also, obviously, very much to Alessandro for putting together this uh, collection, which looks uh, very interesting. Uh, very nice to see a number of people that I've not seen for a while, and also to see a number of people that, in fact, I've never seen. Uh, people I've, you know, I'm seeing here for the first time. Uh, you know, several years ago, uh, Henry Bernstein told me, and I don't think he meant it as, as much of a compliment as I took it to be, <laughs> uh, that he thought that I was, a, uh, if I'm not mistaken, a dialectical deconstructionist. So it is with that kind of a spirit that I entered this project. And uh, I'd been thinking for quite a while, uh, you know, regarding some questions that Henry wrote about for a while, uh, and, particular, and also others did, uh, which was about the non-resolution of the agrarian questions, and in particular, the agrarian question of labor, uh, the idea of different classes of labor. Uh, and this was also coming from sort of, uh, you know, post-colonial Marxists such as Sanyal and so on. And so my sort of take on all of this had been, uh, how does one think about the political subjectivity of workers of today's world? Uh, workers of today's world 
who are inhabiting a space of a non-residution of the agrarian questions where they are sort of you know coming from villages to cities but also back and forth and so forth and where process, with the process of um, becoming proletariat had not played out. Uh, parallel to all of this, I've been sort of seeking the answers, reading, to, reading some classics, like, for example, the Communist Manifesto. And in that itself, uh, you know, I found that the idea of the worker or the proletariat or laborer are quite ambiguous. It is not the case I thought that these were stable categories. And in fact, for the further and more sort of, you know, uh, as time goes on with the Communist Manifesto, and you look at the Russian edition or the German one or the Polish one, they actually distance themselves from a number of things that they say about workers and differentiation and the two great classes and the cataclysmic conflict, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, obviously, in you know, other later works by Marx, such as the ones that Kevin Anderson uh, in his Marx at the Margins translated, uh, there's already a recognition that the political subjectivity of workers towards a transition away from capitalism towards communism or towards socialism uh, was going to play out in very different ways as compared to what had happened within Western Europe and things like that. Now, as these, uh, these ideas were circulating in my head, COVID-19 happened and the world basically shut down. And these were questions that people like Jens and others would have gone out to the field with uh, exquisite and precise methods, conducted rich field work, and they would have come back as and presented, as Henry said, in the best traditions of the social sciences, arguments that were engaged with uh, Marxism in the fullest sense of the word. But now you could not access the field. Uh, you know, what you could see were workers in motion, uh, what you, you could see them on television, what you could see was workers putting out their narratives via social media posts, because of course workers now have smartphones and they are on Twitter and they're on Facebook and they're on WhatsApp. So my whole sort of thing was to try and figure out what these narratives could tell us if only as a snapshot of the condition of workers in, a, in an economy and in a society which is undergoing the non-resolution of the agrarian questions, uh, where the forces of the left, political forces of the left, socialist parties, communist parties, far from being on the ascendant, were in terminal decline. Authoritarian populism is the flavor of Indian politics, the dominant one for some time now. And so the snapshot basically is, is what my paper is about. It, it basically tries to look at uh, the narratives of workers as, as they write these narratives themselves on social media to get back to questions regarding the political subjectivity of workers. And it basically has a reading uh, linking back to the sort of multiplicities of meanings of worker, laborer, proletarian in some canonical uh, works of, of Marx. So that's it, thanks very much. Thank you, Subir, um, and yes, Yes, very, very succinct and, and very much on time as well, which as, as a chair, of course, I'm very happy with. Great. Um, now, um, I don't think Adam Hany or, and Susan Newman have been able to make it. If, if you are hiding somewhere, um, then uh, let me know now. Uh, so since this is not the case, we will, we will proceed to the second sec section, which is how to adopt these concepts and categories, adopting Marxist categories, concepts and framework based on concrete field-based investigations, which is uh, so BSS, uh, not a very likely thing to do right now, not an easy thing to do right now. But for that, we have uh, Ben Selwyn, uh, Mohamed Ali Jan, Satoshi um, Miramura, and uh, Gavin Capps, and uh, uh, Sigi Vertomen have suggested that, that I post uh, a link to a presentation she gave together with uh, Alessandra and Adam on this uh, online instead of her taking off uh, her five minutes just to keep it a bit simple and keep the, 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 the different, the number of presentations a bit down. So, so it is, it is I'm not sure whether I want to thank her for this or whether I say it's a pity, but, but maybe it's a good idea. So thanks. Let's, see. Let's go on to Ben Selby. 
Okay, well, thanks very much. Uh, thanks, Alo, for putting this amazing book together. I mean, you know, when you see my, a lot of edited collections, you're like, yep, definitely not going to read that. Uh, this one is like, it looks amazing and it is, I think, really great. It really contributes a lot. Um, so basically, I started doing my uh, PhD research and I, you know, I started doing it after doing an MA and thinking, you know, God, I'm really clever now. I've done an MA. I'm, I've learned all this stuff. You know, I've read, I read the Communist Manifesto. I know what Marx is all about. And um, and the longer I, the more I got into it, the more stupid I felt and out of depth I felt. Um, and that's a common feeling for most PhD students. Luckily, I had Marx to kind of go back to a lot. And I had Henry Bernstein as my uh, long suffering supervisor, who I think we tortured each other quite a lot with uh, going through the thesis. But I think it it paid off in the end. Uh, uh, I mean, I learned a huge amount. Uh, and, and one of the reasons I think I found it difficult uh, well, many reasons was that, you know, I read the Communist Manifesto, it's such a brilliant short document, it gives you such a vivid conception, you know, you don't need to read, um, uh, you know, something about 16 pages, the main part, and one of the bits in there says, says this, I quote it, the modern bourgeois society has simplified class antagonisms, society as a whole is more and more splitting up into two great hostile camps, into two great classes directly facing each other, bourgeoisie and proletariat. You know, once you've got that, you're set, you know what the future is, apart from the fact that it never arrives and uh, you're continually disappointed. Um, so, you know, I got, uh, so I went to the Northeast Brazil to start doing the field work. And I'll just share my screen really quickly um, and try and, um, oh God, where is the, uh, uh, I don't know if you can see that, no. Um, share, oh, well, I can't see it, I can't find it. Anyway, I went, I went, I did the research, I, I, I saw, um, I was looking at export grape production in Northeast Brazil, had this Communist Manifesto conception of class. Uh, but I went there and I saw that, um, you know, the, 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 there's a big shift over time in the gender division of labor. The, the workers who are being employed, first of all, they're mostly women, and over time they're changed to increasingly men, uh, and the division of labor itself had changed uh, quite significantly. Um, with the gender division labor uh, shifting with many of the kind of delicate nimble fingers type jobs that women workers had done being taken up by men. And that was like, um, you know, that could, the Communist Manifesto consumption class I had could not explain that to me. And, and I have to say now, this is a kind of post hoc rationalization of what I went through. But I think what I started with was a very kind of structuralist conception of class. So, you know, G.A. Cohen, I mean, it's a very powerful a book, you know, he says that a class, a person's class is established by nothing but his objective place in a network of ownership relations. Uh, then he says his consciousness, culture and politics do not enter the definition of his class position. So, you know, that's a very objective. It's nice if you're a social scientist to have that kind of objective analysis, but it doesn't help you show the sh shifts and changes in class relations over time at all. And that's what I'm interested in. That's what all Marxists are interested ultimately. Uh, and so you know, then, you know, you look at people like E.P. Thompson who talk about class experience, uh, Imani Banerjee who says social relations and forms come into their being in and through each other. And so the whole point that I'm making here is that uh, the gender, class and other forms of social differences combine in particular forms and they evolve uh, due to kind of shifts in a balance of class forces. And, um, and class strategies and all kinds of stuff as well. And, you know, these, these kind of rigid conceptions of class, they, they, you know, you need, like Henry said right at the beginning, you know, the essential forms, you need that. You know, these people who talk about just pure experience without any kind of attempt to grasp the essentials are, 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 are I think, uh, problematic. But at the same time, you need to have that kind of focus on the, uh, the, the, the experience and the processes of change and how these are perceived by different social classes as they combine, interact, conflict and collaborate with each other. And I think uh, people like E.P. Thompson are quite useful there and people inspired by him. Um, so it's really the point uh, I think I'm making that chapter is, you know, complex reality demands uh, a, a, a way of approaching it that combines both the kind of a deep understanding of kind of capitalist structures historically, contemporarily in globalization, but also uh, an understanding of how they how they change 
through kind of dialectical class relations. And that is, that's why experience class, the emphasis on experience is so important, but you need both. You need the structural side and you need the kind of experiential side. And it's the field work and working through the field work that helps you uh, kind of come out of it uh, and, and understand it. So I'll finish there. Thanks very much. Thanks, Ben, for this uh, this uh, outline of, of, of how to apply Marx's category in, in, in practice, or in field work. Um, excellent. Uh, we will go straight on to uh, Alijan. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Jens. Thank you, Alessandra. I'm really honored to be a part of this uh, collection and really, really happy to be here talking to all of you. I just also really like the way Ben actually structured the talks. I'm just going to uh, follow that up with my own story at the beginning of how I got to uh, writing this particular uh, chapter and starting with, you know, after uh, doing my master's at SOAS and having Jens as my supervisor, then with uh, Barbara Harris White at Oxford for my PhD, studying agricultural markets. But through agricultural markets, um, trying to understand essentially class relations, accumulation, you know, all the good stuff that Marxists often talk about. And just like uh, what Ben was saying, when you go in with a, with a theoretical, you know, or armed with these concepts, um, what actually hits you, which should have hit you earlier as well, is actually just the complexity of the empirical, right? But it hits you in a double sense and it hits you worse because you're now relying more on certain key concepts to simplify it for you. And I think um, my journey has also been one where you kind of first have the concept, then you think, oh, okay, this is not adequate in itself. You start doing fieldwork and then you come back to these concepts because you can't do without them. As Henry said, we are not you know, empiricists in or positivists in, in that tradition. We need and we believe Marxists along with uh, you know, other social scientists of similar orientation. We believe that uh, you can't really make statements and have social science without conceptual clarity. So, what I was struck by when I was in the field and I had been warned by people like Jens and Barbara earlier was actually the diversity of class relations, right? Um, and I thought after doing some, some field work, which, uh, you know, it's there in the, in, in the thesis and some of the work that I've done subsequently, but it's specifically for this contribution that I, that I wrote in this uh, really, you know, um, special collection that, that Al has managed to edit and put together. And that's an observation that I felt that more than struggles between you know, classes, on the one hand, uh, capitalists, on the other hand, labor, or you can have other permutations of that. What was equally or sometimes more important where I was doing fieldwork and in other places as I found out was actually relations, uh, qualitative struggles within the same class. Right. So different configurations, different groups within the same class. And I was looking for co a concept and a way to operationalize that. And I found that in Marx's idea of fractions, you know, Marx, it's an underdeveloped idea, but it's there in Marx. I think I remember talking to Jens about it back back in the day and then, you know, going about it. He, it's there. It's peppered in all of his historical writings uh, when he's actually looking at concrete cases of, you know, a fraction of the bourgeoisie that is, uh, you know, comes from the landed aristocracy, another one of bankers and this and that. But it's, it's spread all over, but it's not really given a coherence. So I decided to use that for my fieldwork. And I further deployed this, and, and you could basically define it as a relatively cohesive group within the same class. Um, and I tried to define it or, or further uh, conceptualize it along three lines which is one, a scalar dimension, basically a difference between capital that's organized you know, on a larger scale, the a qualitative you know, difference in property becoming qualitative, not simply quantitative. So small and medium versus corporate, you know, just, to, just to put it out there. And then also that translating into different organization and management structures, right? Which was very important and I'll get to that in a second. The second one being spatial, the configurations being concentrated in, uh, in certain spatial regions. And this was very important for my work. This is something that Barbara and Jens had also done where, you know, uh, 
we were looking, all of us were looking at what we call local capitalism, uh, essentially at the rural, urban, small town, you know, location, not in the big cities, not in a, a corporate kind of organization. And the third very important, uh, you know, dimension within this uh, fraction is social origin or, and where I kind of connected to Weber's idea of status. So classes don't simply emerge out of, you know, they emerge out of history and prior social relations. And one very important pre-capitalist kinds of social relations, which continue in capitalism, are those that Weber called status relations that I kind of reinterpret as social origin. And so I then use in the final um, part of the chapter, different case studies from different parts of the world and end with my own field work where, uh, and I kind of make, make it a point to say that this is reflexive work, right? Concepts for me to quote, you know, Herbert Bloomer is, uh, are sensitizing, you know, their way, their lines of investigation. They're not going to ever have the kind of coherence or the kind of definitional uh, coherence that we seek out of, out, out of the, let's say, maybe wrongly out of the natural sciences. So these are, you know, going to be fuzzy to some extent, but we, what we can do is constantly go back and forth between fieldwork, empirical work, and make them more concrete. And I use it in my own fieldwork where I looked at a group of capitalists who had emerged out of the processes of accumulation, rural urban accumulation, um, <clears throat> in two regions of Punjab. And, 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 and you, you, your time is up. Could you? All right. Just, just, I'll just, and, and I'll just end there that I looked at these two regions where some had emerged from refugees who were, you know, small, medium and artisans and others who were local aristocrats. And this was an important line of contradiction within the concrete capitalist classes, this fractional structure. So I'll just stop there. Thank you. And apologies to, by, for, for causing your film, particularly when it gets more and more interesting, but that is, that is the conditions. Um, I don't know if, 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 uh, if you've noticed uh, in, in the latest issue of Global Labour Journal, uh, there is a there's a debate between Jan Bremen and Jonathan Perry about class categories and and how they exist in 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 practice, which uh, is is about labour, not not about capital. But nevertheless, interesting to see how these issues are are very much alive uh, uh, out there as well. Let us go straight on to to Gavin Gavin Katz. Thanks, Jens, and um, thank you, Ellie, basically for everything. Um, it's, it's really great to be here, and hello to everyone. So, um, yeah, in my contribution to a chapter, there, there are actually three of us contributing to a chapter, so mine's very, very brief, but it's an attempt to talk a little bit about the challenge, the challenge of um, actually not just how to apply, but how to develop, how to develop Marx's categories in the analysis of social forms, which are conventionally and typically considered somehow to be outside of the ambit of capitalism, whether described as pre-capitalist or non-capitalist, or whether there are other terms which are used, and therefore beyond the analytical reach of the, of the categories that Marx has bequeathed to us in capital. How to, how to deal with that, how to bridge that gap, and the social form in question was the institution of the chieftaincy in Africa. Uh, tribal authority, traditional authority, customer authority, whatever term, term you want to use. And in seeking to do this, I had three points of departure. One was theoretical, one was methodological, and one was empirical. So the theoretical point of departure were some really significant um, um, interventions within this area by Mahmoud Mamdani, which many of you will know, this is in the subjects, and also as well by Sarah Berry, Chiefs Know Their Boundaries, around about the time I, I, was, I was beginning to think about this, both of which in different ways really illuminated the institution of the chieftaincy and its reproduction in post-colonial orders in very interesting and powerful ways, but also as well, which argued that this somehow was beyond the ambit of Marxist political economy in the way in which Marxist political economy was presented by those authors in terms which was something actually quite limited to only being under, able to understand things in terms of their appearances. So that then brings us to the second point of departure, which is methodological. And let me make a distinction here, which hasn't really perhaps been made so clearly yet. 
which is a di distinction between Marx's methods of inquiry, of analysis and presentation of the type that we get in capital and the method of field work itself, how we actually gather our data and, and, and so on. Now, hopefully there, there will be some sort of connection between the two, but let me just focus on, on, on the first here. And um, really this was, I, I had some sort of understanding, but a very limited one that if one was to try and actually develop categories, which Marx has bequeathed us to deal with such social forms, one would need to have some sense of how Marx's own method actually works in terms of rising from the abstract to the concrete. And here, and it's picking up on a point made earlier by Henry, the distinction between the essential relations and categories of capitalism and the phenomenal forms in and through which these uh, essential relations exist. And um, it was, was the really key thing. So, that, so how can one move from the, what, this one level of analysis to the other, and this is something clearly which needs to take into account many determinations and mediations as we move more and more and more to specific concrete forms and actually existing capitalism. Okay, so that's a methodological point of departure. And the empirical one, which was, which was really the linchpin to it all, but which I really underestimated at the time, I should have mentioned this is my PhD research, ironically ironically, was, was the case I looked at. And the case that I looked at was a chieftaincy in South Africa and what is now South Africa's Northwest province, which stands out in the way in which it has been able to exercise a very, very high degree of um, control over the land which falls under its political jurisdiction and its land which happens to straddle the world's largest platinum reserve and therefore which has massive platinum mining on it and the really interesting thing about this chieftaincy was the way in which it was able to appropriate some of the revenues which were generated through that mining in the form of royalties and I must thank Ben Cousins who's here for directing me to that case many years ago as I must uh, thank Henry who was the long-suffering supervisor he had me and Ben at the same time which really must have been awful. So those are the three points of departure then. And the question is how to bring all of this together. And of course, when you start out on a journey like this, the truth is you don't know. And this was a journey which took me through many intellectual crises, quite honestly. I think you sort of solve one problem and it immediately confronts you with another one. And I think actually, if you're not moving from one sort of crisis to another in a way, maybe you're not doing it right. And I think this really emphasizes the importance of learning by doing here, which Ben mentioned just now. But really just, just to say in two uh, remaining lines or, or, the, or the two seconds I have le left, Jens, what allowed me to begin to move forward was actually seeing that the Bufferkin case itself, with this enormous appropriation of royalties from mining, there was something very distinctive about that, which couldn't be explained in terms of existing attempts to theorize the chieftaincy in Marx's terms. That led me back to Marx. It led me back to his theory of landed property and ground rent, which is presented in volume three, pretty tough place to start off. And then to begin to work out how from there, um, where he uses, of course, examples of British agriculture as it manifests in the 19th century, one can begin to deploy and develop these concepts in relation to communal forms of tenure, forms of customary authority, which appear to be completely different, yet somehow uh, at the same time function as function the same. How do you explain that? How do you explain why these then become the forms of appearance of these essential relations to capitalism? That was that was a challenge. Whether I've been successful, I don't know, but that's what I tried to do. Thanks, Gavin. You certainly were successful in outlining your, your approach, uh, and, and I think it's very clear, and I, I don't need to, to try and sum anything up there. Great. Um, so now, uh, so now we will we will uh, we will uh, 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 we we plan to go on to Siggy's presentation on Marx in utero, a workers' inquiry of the in slash visible labor of reproduction in the surrogacy industry. Uh, but those who want to to have that can can use the link that is provided in in the chat, and we will go straight on to the next. Uh, uh, section of the presentation, section three, which is about which methods to use, what methods are Marxian or compatible with Marxian analysis. Um, and here it, it so happens that the contributors have adopted very different approaches to each other. So, that of course. Satoshi first. 
Oh, I am so sorry that I am, I am in my eagerness to speak through it all. I am cutting out Satoshi. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, Satoshi. I, uh, rewind over to you, Satoshi. We're still in, in the second round, how to adopt the, the, the categories and concepts. Ah. Thank you, Jens, and uh, thank you, and congratulations, Ale, once again, and hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to join this discussion. Uh, so in my chapter, I drew on my long-term field work on trade unions and labor movements in India to illustrate the contemporary relevance of Marx analysis in the study of labor relations and struggles. Uh, and appropriately, I actually started drafting this while I was in the middle of the field work back in 2019. So reading back, I feel it's a somewhat raw and uh, reflecting the struggles that are probably I, I was intellectually going through as well. Anyway, I framed my chapter by uh, positioning my research methodology against the juridical and dualist approaches to labor institutions and methodologically individualistic, reductionist, and conflict-free mainstream conception of labor relations. So I don't know if that means adapting Marx concepts or category as such, but it is perhaps to follow and very much in line of what Ben and uh, Gavin and everybody has said to uh, you know, follow Marx's phrase of concrete analysis of the concrete situation. Uh, and for me, that meant that to reflect on the dialectic of the class as an essential social relations and how class, class is experienced and how class struggle are articulated in their diverse forms. Um, and this led me to challenge uh, conceptual boundaries of formal versus informal, regular and irregular, productive and reproductive, and other uh, demarcations defined struggles across these different spheres. Uh, so for me, this meant informing an agenda for research, but also political mo mobilization that focuses on struggle beyond the gaze of conventional analysis and uh, debates, uh, including mobilization that links workplace struggles with other issues around home place-based, uh, community-based, community relations, housing, healthcare, uh, environment, and others. Uh, and this also gives rise to the state and institutional mechanism that links productive and other struggles as sites for uh, labor struggles. I, I think uh, Marx's method in overcoming these conven conventional boundaries are particularly important and useful in thinking uh, the uh, changing opportunity and spaces for struggle uh, over the past year where the pandemic and the policy responses to it have had an uneven effect on bargaining power and organizational capabilities of workers in different sectors and segments of the global economy. Um, and obviously, uh, these articulation of class struggles are certainly not in any way exhaustive. They're never linear and spaces and linkages opens and narrows and often takes contradictory forms. Uh, but nevertheless, I, I think uh, deploying Marx's method in the field offers a first step uh, in addressing these issues. So I'll stop there. Excellent, and a, and a fitting way of finishing this 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 section of the of the of the presentation. Thanks, Satoshi, and apologies once more. Um, so let us move on to to, to the third section, which message to use. And and uh, as I was uh, already starting to say, what we have here are contributors that have adopted very different approaches to each other, which of course makes it even more interesting to 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 hear the presentations. Um, we have a uh, Farai. Ben Cousins, Tanya, Lorena, and Sarah uh, to present in that order. So, uh, Farai, I will hand over to you for the first presentation. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'll just uh, make some few reflections uh, on the methods uh, th th that we used. So my co-authors and I contributed uh, a chapter on investigating class relations in rural South Africa, uh, chapter 10 of Marx in the Field. And the chapter really looks at uh, class dynamics uh, in four research sites. And we did this research as uh, PhD students uh, at the time, and uh, the South African research in poverty land and agrarian studies. Uh, and my supervisor, uh, Prof. Cousins, is here. So 
during field work, we, we were all grappling uh, with uh, the application of Marxist uh, class analysis uh, in the study of uh, rural class formation. And uh, I will just focus uh, on the question that uh, Alex Alessandra raised. And uh, the question is, uh, there are some methods to conduct uh, field-based research, which can be considered particularly Marxian. So in the chapter, we try to illustrate how or which field and data collection methods can be usefully deployed to study complex uh, local agrarian class structures in, in contemporary settings. We also illustrate uh, that critical realist, uh, the critical realist approach uh, is useful for investigating class dynamics, uh, given that it explicitly draws attention to both observable aspects of social reality and the underlying mechanisms and processes at work. And to a greater extent, we try to show uh, that uh, critical realism has some affinities with uh, Marxist class analysis. So the local agrarian class structures across in the four sites that we looked at can be characterized as complex. And this is typical in much of Southern Africa where households are plurally active, uh, livelihood systems are characterized by a diverse combination of farm and non-farm incomes, but also households are embedded in complex social relations, relations of patriarchy, kinship, lineage structures, gender and generational divisions uh, and dress. And uh, these are, are important uh, in markers of social difference. And, uh, but at the same time, they tend to obscure uh, class stratification. In most instances, you don't readily see uh, sharp class divisions uh, that uh, resemble uh, the, the class stratification uh, portrayed uh, uh, by Lenin, Lenin, in Lenin's analysis of peasants, for instance. So this is one of the things that we, one could readily grapple with uh, when you, for instance, when you visited the field. So, Following Marx, we argue that it's important to understand the class as constituted through multiple determinations and that a reductionist approach, which focuses on ideal type class categories may not sufficiently capture these complexities. So we also critique uh, the institutionalist uh, approaches and anthropological approaches that tend to take a narrow view of Marxist class analysis. Uh, specifically the mistaken view that class analysis is too blunt an instrument to be used in investigating the complexity and contingence uh, of rural social change. But uh, through Marxist class analysis, uh, it's possible to relate the epiphenomenal aspects of social reality, surface phenomena to the underlying, underlying tendencies in capitalist economies. Uh, so basically describing observable phenomena in isolation from capitalist relations can only produce a chaotic conception of the world. So for fieldwork, uh, the four cases that we present in the chapter adopted the crit critical realist approach and uh, Andrew Sayers distinction between uh, the extensive and intensive research approaches was very useful. Uh, so extensive uh, research basically uh, entails the use of uh, quantitative methods and intensive research focuses more on uh, uh, qualitative process where you prioritize the processes at work. Uh, so we used extensive uh, methods to generate numerical data on demographic assets, income sources, and uh, that numerical data was useful in deriving asset categories or groups or groups. So, but we readily we could readily see that those asset groups uh, were merely proxies for wealth differentiation. Uh, they just provided important clues to the mechanisms involved, but uh, could not provide explanatory accounts of the processes at work. So we could not on the basis of asset groups explain social relations uh, for instance uh, relations of poverty inequality and exploitation and then it became necessary to make use of intensive methods uh, so as to understand the underlying processes and uh, mechanisms so uh, I, I think 
uh, what is important is uh, to note that uh, these different uh, methods uh, illuminate different aspects of class and uh, they can be fruitfully combined so to provide a well-rounded understanding of class and produce a, a compelling explanatory account of class dynamics. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Farai. Very, very clear the need to use different methods to, in, in order to, 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 to make use of, of the Marxian categories in, in the fields. Excellent. Let us go straight to Ben and Cousins. You are still on mute, Ben. Uh, thanks very much. Okay, uh, I won't add much to what Farai has to say. I'll just add something, a thought on the on the politics of this. Why, why were we so concerned to examine class relations in rural South Africa? So I think just to say that the, the post-apartheid context uh, is one in which uh, politics is very is very much still um, one of, of racial privilege uh, and struggles around race. Uh, but at the same time, it's very clear that there are fundamental class dynamics shaping the society which are not reflected adequately in all forms of politics. I mean, that itself is a, is a site of struggle. But um, in, in the field in which we work, in other words, in relation to land reform and agrarian reform more broadly, this question of who should benefit actually is a key issue. Um, and there, um, th in other words, the question is, what is the class agenda of land reform? And hiding behind the discourse of uh, racial redress is in fact, um, an act of class politics of elite capture, mirroring to some extent what, what's happening at, uh, within the, the process of so-called state capture. So our research has tried to make contributions to this uh, understanding the ways in which rural populations are quite differentiated. Um, and in fact, in, in, in some cases, we've argued that populist conceptions of uh, land to the poor are not actually very appropriate in a context like South Africa. In other words, we have to think very carefully and clearly about class in order to define a realistic, achievable and useful agenda for land and agrarian reform. Um, and that's really, you know, I think so many publications have attempted to engage not only the state, but also a range of activist uh, formations uh, who are struggling with these questions. So the research was intended as an act of contribution to those very on, those powerful ongoing uh, and controversial sites of struggle in South Africa. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. And good to be reminded of why we're doing research and, 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 and why this particular piece of research uh, was done in the context for it. We'll hopefully return to those issues as well uh, in the discussion afterwards. Um, thanks. Let us go on to Tanya, Tanya uh, Tufanin. You are, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thanks uh, to Alessandra for this project and uh, for organizing uh, uh, the presentation. So, in my contribution, uh, I examine Marx's analysis of the relationship between industrialization and working conditions, drawing then to consider industrial home working in Italy, uh, which was uh, at the topic of my. Um, degree uh, at the end of the 90s. So uh, in particular, I focus on the analysis of the relationship between labor exploitation and health. And uh, this is a topic also of uh, uh, chapter eight of Capital, where uh, Marx uh, and, uh, basically examined the working day. And this chapter traces uh, Marx's observation on health in an attempt to alight their close connection with work and emphasizes the value of the historical materialist explanation in analyzing the connection between capitalist development and the expropriation of our health. It must be underlined that uh, since the early decade of uh, um, the 20th century England, the British Parliament has promoted extensive social legislation and uh, uh, this kind of apparently uh, contradictory dynamics uh, of growth and poverty already considered, uh, for example, by Alexis de Tocqueville in a memoir on pauperism, at the same time, 
is really at the heart of Marx analysis developed in capital. So what is the field here? Uh, Marx did not carry out interviews, rather he examined several key secondary sources, uh, such as uh, the reports of factory inspectors, uh, the reports of the Children's Employment Commission and the public uh, health report. Why is the analysis uh, uh, he carried out uh, so crucial? Basically because uh, it testified uh, uh, to the ability to read social dynamics by integrating the analysis of factual reality, social legislation, and occupational health. Marx uh, play, paid attention to the complexity of social norms applied by the British Parliament at that time, and he spent really a lot of time analyzing the Factory Act and the main reports on the working conditions. Um, Marx's descriptions of working conditions uh, uh, in uh, sweet shops of the 19th century London is uh, fully comparable to what happens today in the uh, sweet shops of working for HM, Zara, and other global fashion brands. Uh, furthermore, uh, my chapter also discuss, discusses uh, how the Marxian methodology, methodological perspective is crucial for the analysis of all types of labor that normally statistic, statistical conventions, as they are social conventions, defined as non-standard forms of employment, but which we know to be a fundamental part of the global labor history. Among these, uh, home-based work uh, occupies a prominent place. In this way, I try to describe working conditions uh, among industrial home workers in Italy. And uh, um, as we uh, learned during the, this pandemic, uh, when work is undertaken at home, it becomes part of the domestic life in a dimension uh, where people are familiar with. Uh, at home, long working hours and harmful uh, substances are reconstructed and as less problematic. Uh, this aspect uh, uh, in particular explains what has driven many Italian entrepreneurs uh, in the last century, not really now, but uh, we have a coming back of this uh, form of production, of course, to outsource some stages of the production process to home workers, especially those involving the use of hazardous or toxic materials. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Um, uh, let us go straight on to uh, Lorena. Hi, everyone. Thanks, uh, Ale and Jens for chairing this session. I'll try to be very brief because it's Friday afternoon and it's 30 degrees, not 30, 20 degrees in London. But yeah, uh, so my chapters um, builds on my doctoral research thesis, which looks at um, the role of the state in Uzbekistan. And this chapter looks particularly at the methodology that I use to analyze patterns on agrarian labor in the rural areas. Um, so I was working in Uzbekistan between 2010 and 2013. And when I came to SOAS to do my PhD, I realized that when I was Googling labor, Uzbekistan, the keywords were automatically associated with issues of forced labor. And although uh, this is uh, something that is, has to be acknowledged within like my research, uh, I found the dichotomy of force versus free labor quite problematic. So one of the first contribution that Marx had helped to unpack and problematize even further is exactly that. So these chapters try to um, ontologically question this, this um, mainstream dichotomy of um, free versus unfree labor by starting with what Marx understood as an historical process of labor um, coercion and looks at actually degree of exploitation. So the first point that can be made explicit is that uh, the historical materialist approach uh, has helped at least my research to explain 
uh, the different institutional material um, and social con constraints that made uh, labor um, certain degrees of exploitation present in my case studies. Um, and this is contradicts completely with what is not Marxist because it's typically analyzed as a snapshot and a high historical and disembedded by the, by the time and, con and space constraints uh, in which labor operates. The second uh, issues it's uh, related to that is that um, we, we bypass and with the Marxist analysis we are able to bypass the uh, canonic economy as an economist I have to constantly negotiate uh, the hegemony of methodological individualism but I, we can look at a labor as a relational process so in a context where um, the government and the role of the Soviet Union has played a huge role in shaping the organization of production um, we cannot deny that labor doesn't really operate within a context of within a labor market of uh, supply and demand, but rather in an institutionalized and politicized the process of configuration of top down production in the case of my chapter of cotton production. Um, uh, and this is a particular, uh, very important policy implications when we look at the way labor is, uh, you know, narrated within the context of international financial institutions or a very big uh, think tanks will look at forced labor without understanding what are the macroeconomic or, for instance, the role of multinational corporation in um, enabling uh, such as labor conditions. Um, and so uh, to conclude, uh, because we need to acknowledge the, and this is the key words of the book, I think the complexity of reality, um, most, I mean, I guess as many of others, uh, others in this book, I uh, offered an example of uh, mixed methods. So uh, I relied on a multitude of approaches, uh, both quantitative and qualitative. Uh, by following an inductive process, so without assu assuming prior assumption about rationality or utilitarian approaches. And this has been, uh, although associated with a retroductive uh, approach, because I wanted to look and inform uh, prior uh, theoretical patterns. Uh, and I stop here. <laughs> Thanks, Lorena. So is this the Marxian approach? Is there such a thing? Um, now, uh, Sarah, over to you. You, 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 you have the honor of being the last one to present. Um, um, yes, let's just over to you. Thank you so much, Jens. Uh, yes, an honor and a responsibility. Uh, if I had known that I would be the last, I would have prepared something more entertaining, but <laughs> hopefully we'll be fine. But thank you so much, Aleph, for having put together this great collection. It's really a pleasure to be here. So just to address uh, the question that was put to us on uh, the existence of some Marxian methods for data collection and for field work. So in the field of food and nutrition, which is what I deal with uh, in the context of my chapter, um, I would say there is not a specific Marxian method, but I would suggest that Marxian methods are those that allow us to see um, individual and household food consumption practices and nutrition outcomes uh, as emerging from processes of social reproduction and the concentration of capital. So as a way, uh, a bit like along the lines of what Morena was saying of going beyond the methodological individualism as also myself working as an, as an economist, I uh, need to operate in this field where these negotiations are uh, always quite important. Uh, um, so uh, um, there is not, I think, a very specific guidance uh, on uh, concrete methods uh, to be used uh, to do this. Uh, and uh, hopefully I will explain why this is the case uh, in uh, the next uh, two minutes. Um, but starting with uh, um, how Marx uh, uh, addressed the issue of uh, uh, laborers, diets and nutrition in capital. Uh, in my chapter, I focus on chapter 25 of uh, volume one. Uh, so we are uh, thinking about the law of capitalist accumulation and uh, Marx, uh, uh, Marx's interest uh, in labor diets uh, and their nutrient intake specifically uh, is to be seen as part of uh, uh, his uh, um, 
uh, elucidation of uh, uh, the law of capitalist accumulation. Um, and so evidence of poor diets uh, among the British working class of the, 19, of the late 19th century um, is portrayed by Marx uh, as a manifestation of the immiseration of the working class, which is caused uh, um, by the expansion of capital accumulation and the associated displacement of workers. So, so very much uh, tied, tied into uh, the notion of uh, surplus population, um, which I think is not the only, but one of the reasons that makes uh, this lens uh, very relevant uh, to analyze the food and nutrition among vulnerable uh, and poor workers in the contemporary world. Um, so in Capital, uh, Marx uh, uses data on the nutrient intake of agricultural and factory workers uh, collected through public health investigations. So, so in this sense, he uses secondary data on nutrient intake. Uh, um, and what these data show um, uh, is that diets uh, of the working class uh, um, at the time uh, were poor in protein intake, so very low consumption of meat, fish, dairy, and also fresh vegetables. Uh, and their diets uh, were instead mostly based on uh, carbohydrates uh, and the uh, fat, uh, although often they were scarce uh, in this respect too. So interestingly, the link that I make in my chapter is that so looking at the evidence on contemporary diets uh, among the poor classes, uh, or the terminology that I uh, would use is that of classes of labor, uh, thanks to Henry, uh, in the contemporary sub-Saharan Africa um, uh, context, uh, and I'm looking particularly at Mozambique and Ghana. So the diets of the classes of labor in Mozambique and Ghana are actually very similar to those uh, uh, described by Marx in that chapter 25. Um, and they're similar in that they are characterized by low protein content uh, and overall reliance uh, on carbohydrates and fat. Uh, but there is at least a one important difference. Uh, uh, and this uh, difference is that uh, um, these diets are also characterized by high consumption of packaged uh, and processed food, uh, in, particular, in particular soft drinks uh, uh, and snacks. And so this feature points to the importance of looking at capital concentration in agri-food production, and in particular, the pervasive role that the food industry plays in shaping food consumption and nutrition, which is, of course, something that we can understand through a Marxist political economy framework. Um, uh, however, this component uh, has remained uh, largely neglected uh, in the contemporary literature on nutrition in particular, and to some extent also on food. And the reason for this is that uh, biomedical approaches uh, to nutrition specifically have prevailed uh, in recent decades uh, and therefore our understanding of nutrition has become highly individualized and detached from broader capitalist transformations. So um, I uh, suggest in the chapter that it is necessary both methodologically and uh, so both conceptually, sorry, and methodologically to re-embed the study of food and nutrition into uh, a Marxist political economy framework, uh, and perhaps uh, from my perspective also into a Marxist feminist political economy framework for the gendered and the social reproduction elements uh, that are important in this picture. So uh, we now have extensive data on individual nutrition, which are quite good. And we also have extensive data sets on household food consumption, although uh, this data is often not particularly good or precisely because it doesn't capture very well uh, food consumption that takes place away from home. And so for example, it underestimates uh, the consumption of uh, uh, soft drinks and snacks uh, that is uh, so important, I think, in uh, the analysis of contemporary diets. Uh, um, so there is uh, some, yes, I'm, I'm closing. So there is some work to be done in order to uh, uh, improve a primary data collection on this, but also linking this uh, to the macro analysis of food systems. Uh, and uh, with analysis of labor regimes and the organization of production and reproduction in everyday life. So I would say, like Lorena said, a combination of methods, but more work uh, to be done in order to uh, trace uh, these uh, uh, linkages at multiple scales. And I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And, th and that concludes this, this uh, amazing round of presentations. I, I, I think it shows how far this book is taking our discussions very well. It showcases it in so many different areas. And I'm not going to try to summarize any of it, but, but, but there's so much inspiration here to be had, which is great. So 
we now just before five o'clock uh, i think formally the program was meant to go till five so i i, I think the 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 contributors have been forewarned that if if they were willing to so then 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 the organizers would 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 take it a bit further so we'll see how many uh, that would like to continue the discussion but what we are into now is the, di <clears throat> the discussion part of the of the of the afternoon, afternoon here in London, at least. Um, there is, as I, as I mentioned earlier, there is the political impact, the political aspects of this. And it'd be great to get some comments from the uh, con con contributors on that. There's also any discussions, or comments to, to the different presentations by the contributors and also by any anyone else that has taken part. Uh, I think let us just start with, uh, uh, with if, if the I, or a brief round of comments on the political impact, and then we open up the floor for discussion and comments, etc. Et um, anyone who would like to kick off a, a, a brief round of comments on the political impact of, of this? I think we have Steve Ballard um, uh, ready there. Um, Steve? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I, I, I've just got a few, I've written a few things down. It's about, it's just a couple of paragraphs. Since humankind's unconscious creation of Earth uh, until Newton's scientific proof of, of the natural in inevitability of its conscious extinction, its total population barely grew. Since then, it's been growing exponentially. Kant was the first one to make to, to use Newton's irrefutable proof of our natural extinction to place it upon scholars to use their scholarship to, the, to, the, to, to repudiate all wars of survival until then, conscious of our uh, finite existence. Um, and before he died, before Marx died, leaders calling themselves Marxists were un uncritically colluding in wars of national survival. And Engels repudiated this clearly, lucidly, in his in all his works. Um, uh, but but m people who call themselves Marxists in the Soviet Union and elsewhere, they everywhere continue to justify wars of human survival. Now the whole burden of Marx's contribution, ontological contribution, I would call it, um, to the role of scholarship is to recreate the conditions necessary for our convivial existence on earth until its natural end. Now, I don't, I'm, I'm yeah, uh, none of the arguments I've heard this afternoon, it, 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 you know, seem to have addressed that ontological, that philosophical, that, that, that existential issue um, that Marx was at the core of Marx's contribution to the critique of capitalism. Um, and, and so on the basis of that, what I've heard this afternoon, I remain skeptical about the potential of this book to change the course of history, but I, of course, would be delighted, delighted to be proved wrong. And I look forward to hearing more. Thank you, Steve. Uh, I, I actually shouldn't have let you come in now, but because I, I wanted first to, to, to have any comments from the from the presenters if, uh, to, to, to the political uh, importance. But I think that is that serves as a good background for anyone who would who, uh, who would like to 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 come in here. Um, anyone of the of the of the presenters that would like to to comment on this or, or on any other aspects of the political uh, uh, importance of the book. And just to say that you don't have necessarily to show that the book is going to change the history of humankind, because uh, although I like you all very much, I actually think that was uh, <laughs> a bit too much to even ask my dream team. Um, <laughs> So it would be great if any of you wants to comment on the political relevance uh, and also if we can perhaps uh, bring Sigi in on, uh, um, on that, perhaps, because we had a very long discussion about uh, um, uh, political relevance, in fact, in uh, the session that we organized uh, instead last week at Get Yes. Uh, yeah, maybe very briefly. Um, in my chapter, I actually focus a lot on, on, on praxis and what how Marx has helped me to not only critically deconstruct um, like what he calls bourgeois political economy, um, but also to, to reconstruct, right? And to, to offer 
new tools um, of inquiry. In my case, for my chapter, that was um, the, 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 the concept of reproductive labor, not only as an analytical category, but also as a political category, as one that allows us to organize. And for instance, in my own work, which is with uh, uh, Georgian surrogates who um, gestate babies for international uh, infertile couples, um, for me, this has you know, a focus on, on, on reproductive labor and um, that's not necessarily developed by Marx, but by his, um, as I call them, disobedient uh, feminist granddaughters. Um, I think it has, has, has helped me, for instance, to see a lot of similarities between the, way, the ways in which Georgian surrogates are um, exploited, disciplined in their work, in their labor. And for instance, the cleaners at my university in Ghent, who are also outsourced, right, and whose work has also been made invisible, um, devalued, uh, naturalized, and so forth. So I think in that sense, Marx and, and a lot of Marxist and feminist Marxist scholars have actually um, helped in a way to, um, to at least give some avenues of inquiry and of, of political action to, to allow us to change the world. So I think for many of us who have contributed to the book, that praxis, um, that, 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 that uh, urge to not only analyze, but also uh, change the world in a way, I think it's still very present, at least for, I'm speaking for myself now. Alessandro, do you want to say something on, on the politics? Yes, um, I would say that uh, I see, uh, of course, all of us have dif very different trajectories uh, and all of us actually participate in different forms of uh, either political campaigning or um, uh, sort of uh, more formal politics uh, within a context of different institutions that might be labor movements, trade unions, uh, 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 and other uh, organizations. But I think uh, uh, I'll limit my comments um, on two issues. The first is uh, um, what, uh, you know, uh, uh, how a book like this uh, that uh, tries to uh, reclaim Marx from the point of view of fieldwork uh, can actually claim in terms of uh, uh, political uh, praxis. And uh, um, I limit myself to two things, but as I said, we had a very fruitful discussion on this uh, together with Adam as well on the links that you can actually look at in the chat. And the first is, uh, um, really, uh, you know, uh, notwithstanding the sort of the great uh, uh, interventions and contributions you can make by using Marx at the very abstract level of analysis, uh, the overall scope of this book uh, to push uh, 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 Marx and analysis through the lens of fieldwork was to actually be truthful, in fact, to what uh, uh, Marx's own uh, uh, sort of objectives were uh, in his own time. There was at the same, uh, for, for once, to sort of uh, critique uh, by then classic political economy by sort of revealing uh, the mystified and sort of uh, uh, problematic categories he was using um, and instead centered uh, exploitation as the driving force behind uh, uh, is capitalist presence, which is still very relevant to our capitalist presence, and uh, uh, also to sort of uh, unpack and dissect and uh, uh, instead explore the uh, logics and history of the of um, you know of, of capitalism in his own time. So, in, in, in there is a, a, a very specific uh, political project to uh, continue doing that, and without uh, wanting to be overcritical, I think instead. A very significant part of Marxist analysis has evolved more to then dissect Marx and to uh, sort of develop the political economy of Marx, as opposed to going back to the study of the global present. So I'll just see the entire book as a sort of intervention uh, uh, there, by all means. And uh, um, yes, so I, I, and it, it, relatedly, I would say that um, that. Uh, uh, um, the uh, you know the 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 unveiling of uh, specific uh, um, uh, practices and processes on the ground uh, speak about uh, the ways in which by representing given reality we also 
try to sort of uh, uh, um, develop tools to then fight it. Also this then to save Marxist uh, uh, political economy from its more, I would say, classifying tendency, which we have seen perhaps uh, a little bit of in development economics. Yeah, I'll stop here. Thanks. And I think we should now open up uh, the discussion for everyone who wishes to, to, to comment or ask questions. Or, or anything else um, for for a, a short for for not too long, but let us let us, let us go to that now. Um, who would like to kick off? Um, and Steve's question, of course, um, to, to some extent was answered by Sandra, but it is still there, of course. Um, uh, I have a question here from uh, George uh, Togas to everyone. A question, please. Is there anything? Uh, on the book about dialectics and the dialectic uh, uh, methods of analysis. It seems to me that one of the most significant contribution of Marxism is dialectical analysis. Has anyone attempted dialectics as a methodological tool? I think the answer is yes, but who, who would like, to, who would like to, to, to comment on that? Well, I can suggest people, but then I have to, then it'll be people I know, <laughs> so, which is which is not the best way of doing so. So, so um, who would like to, to come in on that? Well, then I will do so. I'll, I'll ask Gavin, would you like to come in on that? <laughs> okay, I'll try. <laughs> Um, no, it's, it's a really fantastic question, and um, you know I haven't had time yet to because I'm still waiting for it to arrive to go through the, the, the whole weight of the book and where it does this. And I'm not sure that there would be any particular chapter LA you can tell us which um, gives an ABC of actually how to do it, um, as a, as in a roadmap. This is this is what you need to do. Um, to to develop a dialectical analysis of some concrete situation or another, but I think it's worth mentioning that Marx himself nev never did that. I mean, you know, he was going to write his three or four famous printers sheets on on the rational kernel and Hegel's method, never got round to it. And the argument always is, if you really want to understand how Marx um, deployed and reworked the Hegelian dialectic, then, then, then really you have to read the work and see it in action and see it in process. You, you, you have to recapital essentially. Well, I, I suppose maybe, and, and I don't know, um, I'll let you tell us, but maybe to a limited extent, the same thing is at work here as well, by actually seeing at least some degree of reflection of the ways in which some of us have attempted to do that, dealing with quite different phenomena in quite different situations and for quite different ends, there's a sense of also how we've tried to do it. And, and, and of course, the finished work, the published work itself is, is whether we've um, been successful or not. But, but I think at the end of the day, it's one of those things where you can only, um, unfortunately, that you can only get the hang of it by actually doing it. I think there are many many great books on Marx's method out there. Um, they, they, they continue to be published. They're very, very interesting. As Ale said, most of them are falling within the sphere of Marxology to unlocking Marx and the way he thought and why he structured the success, successive um, manuscripts of Capital, why he did. Far less on the actual application of Marx's um, methods and categories themselves. But nevertheless, um, I think in actually seeing how people have tried to do it is really important, and then essentially trying, trying, trying to do it yourself. That that's probably not very helpful, but but I I, th I don't think there's any I don't think there's any substitute for the the real genuine actually um, intellectual struggle, which 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 is part of actually trying to do that and trying to do that seriously. I I don't know whether that helps at all. Thank you, Jens. <laughs> Thanks, Gavin. Uh, ben, is is this on your hand? Is up? Is this uh, on this particular issue? Uh, it's partly uh, not strictly on dialectics. It's about uh, about methods in particular. So, if someone wants to talk about dialectics, I'll wait. But it, uh, I just wanted to make a point about theoretical can, approaches. Can we just ask uh, Alessandra if if she has anything to add to what Gavin says? 
No, I actually would like to ask uh, Ben to sort of uh, go. Over to you, Ben. Okay, um, so look, um, I think it may, it may be true that there are no methods uh, for data gathering um, that are unique to Marxism, uh, as, as Henry was suggesting at the beginning. But I think that begs the question, are some approaches in social science more compatible with Marxism than others? And if so, what are they? And what are the implications for research design? So um, I'm not sure that the book actually does sufficient justice to this question. Um, and I think that Henry's, Henry's otherwise brilliant chapter is, uh, is evidence of that because the person he cites in the section on methods is Weber at, at most length. In other words, it's quite a conventional, straightforward, you know, what is social science kind of question. But I think that um, re my suggestion is that we, um, as, as explained a little bit by Farai, that we should uh, in be engaging more directly with the uh, with the realism as a as a philosophical approach and critical realism specifically, and here we, as for I said, be thinking of Andrew Sayer's suggestions in, in particular about intensive versus extensive research designs and the and the ways in which different baskets of methods be, can be combined, and of course these rest on ideas about theories and concepts, causality, explanation, relationships and patterns, and structure which I think are well aligned, which accord well with, with, with Marx's method. Um, and uh, I would say that um, the, uh, it's, it's, it's not so much, uh, I, th I think what Gavin is talking about, the, the, the efflorescence of, this right, of discussion of Marx's method is absolutely relevant here. But when you're, when you're a PhD student or when you're a researcher and you're designing a research project, what methods are you going to use? In what sequence? How are they going to be combined? And how is this going to be put to work within a Marxist theoretical framework? These are practical questions, which we don't have a lot of uh, practical guides to. Ali's uh, uh, int introduction talks about an, a, a, a book published a long time ago. I think it's uh, Steve, Stephen Devereaux and somebody else, which he said was very useful. But again, this is, uh, and she says that I haven't seen the book, but she says it has, directions about how to do political economy. And uh, what I'm suggesting is that critical realism does begin to, you know, in particular when it's exploring the practical implications, does begin to engage with these questions which we have been discussing today. So it's just urging us to have a look at, at that particular strand of thinking. Interesting, Ben, and, and maybe also something that, that, that this book will, 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 will Further, the discussion of how to how to how to progress from here, because we now have a book that actually, uh, through empirical, uh, through discussing uh, methods <clears throat> uh, from a Marxian perspective, uh, have opened up that discussion much more than than maybe it was before. Uh, but uh, of course, please comments and uh, and agreements, disagreements uh, do 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 chip in. The next one I have on the list is is. Uh, Victoria. Hello, thank you. Thank you for wonderful presentations. Um, I really look forward to reading the book. Um, I, I was wondering, do you, uh, does the book focus at all on, on the restructuring of class relations uh, in the context of crisis? And is there anyone on the panel who can offer any advice when it comes to uh, documenting and studying long lasting legacies of um, class shifts in the context of, of crisis? I find that it's um, well, when can you start pointing to legacies? Obviously, it's, it's difficult to study when a crisis is uh, unfolding. Um, and then I'll just uh, throw out a very broad and ambitious question for whoever wants to say anything about it. Um, how would you, what, what do you expect in terms of uh, legacies, in terms of the recomposition of class and of social, rela social relations of production? um of of the the current covid 19 pandemic and uh, of course the public health measures to to tackle it as well thank you um, thank you victoria i i think i'll just just continue with, with the people who have put themselves forward to, to, for, to ask questions and comments and then others can join in and answer or, or not as it were um, sarah 
Thanks, yes. So I'm sorry, I, I wasn't planning to address uh, Victoria's questions directly, but I wanted to say something uh, following up on what Ben was saying, which finds me very much in agreement. Uh, I do think that there are some practical questions uh, in terms of uh, what concrete methods for data collection we can use and how we make sure that uh, we develop an analysis uh, that uh, um, can uh, explain uh, what we're interested in uh, uh, studying um, within uh, the context of a Marxist political economy framework. And so to go back uh, to the theme of food, which is uh, what I focus on in my chapter, I think it's very clear that uh, conceptually, so of course uh, the study of food and nutrition has moved in a very unhelpful way in uh, uh, the past few decades. And so this is where some of the problems uh, come from, and these are not unique to these uh, fields of study. Um, but there is also uh, an issue of having some conceptual guidance, uh, which is not matched by uh, guidance uh, on concrete uh, methodological approaches uh, that can be used uh, in order to make uh, those uh, micro macro linkages, uh, as uh, one could uh, be um, saying uh, if we want to use an economic language. Uh, um, uh, between uh, uh, individual uh, diets uh, and uh, food consumption and uh, macro processes, uh, uh, you know, within uh, capitalist transitions. Uh, and, and so I think, for example, conceptually, uh, there is, uh, uh, on this particular topic, Ben Fine's work on uh, uh, the system of provision, which I find very helpful. Uh, but again, I think that some concrete methodological questions uh, still need to be um, uh, dealt with. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, we as a group uh, should uh, uh, not move away from these questions. We should address them. Uh, and there is more work to be done in this direction. Um, so, yeah, it was just to add that. Uh. Thank, thank you, Sarah. Um, the next one, the next speaker is uh, Mohammed Jan. I'm <clears throat> sorry, but but before uh, before I, I I hand over to you, let, let me just alert you to to the uh, to the uh, chat where we we have uh, several contributions now. The latest one by Barbara Harris White, uh, which I haven't read yet, so I can't say anything about it. Uh, but uh, for now, I'll, I'll hand over to you, Mohammed Jan. Just thank you so much. I just wanted to kind of like uh, maybe just say something about this discussion on method. Um, I, I, from what <coughs> I've understood, you know, from you know reading um, Henry's work, uh, uh, Jens's talking to Barbara, just thinking about this stuff again, being in the field, more than having one set method, it often to me when I was doing field work, it was often about what kind of research question you were, you were asking, you know? And so it usually, and of course that's easier said than done that the research question then immediately guided you to the kinds of kind of method. It, it doesn't square off that neatly, but at least it kind of provides you one kind of way, you know, one direction in which to orient your method or methods. So I think one could say that this is a, there is a dialectic here at play uh, in the sense that there is a tension when you're asking a particular question and then methods, certain kinds of methods become visible and then how far do they kind of fit in? But I think whenever one talks about method, uh, it's really important to have that conjoined with it, the idea of like what specific question, uh, research question you're asking, because I think that would often be um, something that will be more concrete in, in guiding us uh, forward, right, rather than sticking to a method uh, per se or, or a specific kind of, of method, uh, just hanging in there, a general method hanging in there. And I'm reminded of Paul Feyerabend's classic work on you know, philosophy of science titled Against Method, right? In the sense that even in science, I mean, there is no one scientific method, at least according to Feyerabend, I don't know. Uh, practicing, practicing scientists might agree or disagree, but I found it a very, compelling uh, read uh, as a non-natural uh, scientist, at least. So yeah, we'll just put, in that, put that out there. Thank you, Mohammed, and, and both, both for, for your reference to, to, to the actual field work and also the, the more general discussion you, 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 you threw at the table here at the end. And let us go on to Henry. Uh, 
Okay. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. At my age, I'm much slower with this technology than virtually everybody else is present. Um, I just wanted to make a couple of observations. I, I think the book is fantastic, and I think it was a really important thing to do. One of the things that the discussion we're having now suggests is that we need at least two or three or more successor volumes to this. I don't think Alessandra will be <laughs> will be up, up, up for overseeing that. But several things have come up that struck me, which I think in my piece, and I'm sure in many of the others, we had to consciously avoid in order to be able to say anything that was useful, limited but useful. One of the things I, I felt I had to avoid was this massive literature within and around Marxism up to the present day and continuing, as others have said, about the philosophical basis of Marx's method in the broadest sense. I mean, that is another, you know, it, it, it's Encyclopedia Britannica sized or more. So there was that. Another issue was, which I find intrudes all the time in my own thinking, and I have to be robust in sort of holding it at bay, is all the histories of disputation within Marxism. You know, his political, um, theoretical, and so on. And that sort of connects with the tremendous opening, quite legitimate, but almost impossible to manage in a book like this that Steve Ballard raised, which is the, you know, the, the message of Marx and Marxist traditions for humanity of for humanity as a whole and the future of, of humanity. Although one of the things that struck me in Steve's comments was about all the ostensibly socialist, we might say sto state socialist regimes, which have waged wars. And with going back to my earlier point, which I won't elaborate on, of course, one can always ask, were those wars waged in the name of socialism and humanity as a whole? Or were they waged, in effect, under the banner of nationalism? And that, of course, you know, opens another whole Pandora's box that it didn't seem to me that, that uh, Alessandra's book and its conception could even begin to approach. And I think that the book is limited, but in a very positive sense, which is it speaks to what it says on the label you know it's about how to do empirical research inspired by or in a number of cases needing to qualify expand perhaps even in some instances like social reproduction subvert the inherited conceptions um, from Marx I think there is quite a lot of dialectics in the book but it's not written about as essays in dialectics in the way that many Marxologists have done, you know, in very, in very positive ways. But I think the thing to hold on to concretely is, which is central to dialectics, is the notion of contradiction. Because I think all the contributions to the book in different ways less explicitly perhaps in many, in most cases, but they confront contradictions. They confront various contradictions of social existence in capitalism today. And for me, that is to, 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 to breathe the, the spirit of dialectics, if not to have long, possibly convoluted discussions of dialectics and the dialectical um, method. I'm also very struck because my own chapter was not very directly political, but I'm particularly struck by 
the South African contributions, uh, including Gavin's short uh, uh, statement about analyzing chieftaincy, and then of course the work that Ben and his co-authors did um, on, on studying reproduction and class in rural South Africa, is that they are indeed interventions in pretty topical political issues. You know, mining revenues, who controls the benefits of mining and mining income, which is Gammon's work, an important part of it, and, and Ben's work in the relation of continuing debates, although I know Ben doesn't find them very helpful, about some kind of agricultural and rural development policies for the, the new South Africa. Anyway, enough. Thanks, Henry. And, and uh, I think your, your contribution here also maybe takes us towards the end so in, the, in the overview that you presided here. If we have, uh, um, uh, uh, we had Gavin uh, on the list, uh, uh, and, and I would say you, you, could, you, could, you would be the last speaker, and then uh, Alessandra can, 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 can give us a few words uh, by way of finishing afterwards. Gavin? If you're still on the on on for 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 for, for time to to talk, yeah, that that does feel a bit unfair having guessed on so much. But thanks. No, well, I mean, one thing which has emerged, I think, maybe in terms of which methods do we deploy for the um, capturing of data for for, a cap for the caption of empirical realities that we're dealing with. Um, as Mohammed has said, uh, it entirely depends on what you're trying to find out and, wh and what you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. So, so that's why there can be no blanket prescription for this. So that's ju just to make that point. And clearly, that has to be related both to you know the actual thing that you're interested in researching and also the the particular analytical tools that you're bringing to bear on it. So, so, so it's clearly in in those instances is where you make. Those, those sorts of judgments. And um, I suspect many of us use a variety of, of different methods which allow us to do different things, capture different aspects of, of a particular social reality and we try and work out how it fits together. A second point though is I do wonder, I mean, I'm just throwing it out there. I'm so sorry, because we are at the end now, but I do wonder whether there is one thing maybe that we might all do as Marxist inspired researchers, but I could be wrong about this, but I'm just interested, which is maybe all of us to some degree, whether over long durations or more sh shortly, take history seriously. In other words, we have a sense that capitalism is something in motion, it's something constantly developing, and that its forms um, aren't just taken as given, but they've come from somewhere and they're going somewhere. And I wonder how much of our work, you know, ac across the board, there's wh whether implicitly or explicitly, there's a sensitivity to that, that we don't just do a static snapshot anal analysis of anything at one moment in time and consider that adequate. I think that is something which would be quite true to what Marx does, but may maybe I'm wrong, maybe there are ways around that. And then the final point was just really another thing that we didn't perhaps get into um, in thinking about method um, is obviously, um, although some people did mention it, are the various problems and challenges that come from the fact um, that precise as researchers, we are situated within a political field. Um, that the, the field is also a political field. Somehow we're inserted in it. We become a part of the story. What does that mean for what we do? So I'm thinking here of Jan Bremen's famous paper between accumulation and immiseration, but actually how we think of the analytic, how we think of the analytical train, uh, sorry, how we think of the train that we're entering analytically and how we how we try and deal with that. I'm, I'm not sure, Ale, whether there are any reflections on that, but it does seem quite an important thing as well. <clears throat> Thank you. Now, uh, I was I was trying to to draw this to a close, but I can see that, that Ben has has uh, uh, and, and Lorena have, have asked for a last comment. Could you please do it uh, quite briefly, uh, Ben, first? Uh, very briefly, just to, to uh, add to what Gavin is saying about history, I think time is a key dimension. So if we want to understand dynamics, underlying relations, we need to collect material at different points in time and understand what, what has changed and what has not, try to grapple with explaining that. 
that has implications practically for research design. One should, if possible, interview people at different points in time, possibly in surveys. You should actually, you can collect uh, snapshots of firms or markets at different points in time. So I think, you know, even though our time frames are often constraining, uh, taking this dimension of time and the underlying processes which explain differences over time is, I think, key to and, uh, the kind of work that we want to do. Thanks. Um, Lorena? Yeah, no, sorry, I just wanted to answer Vic's question because I think it's a, a, an important one <laughs> and the, I think it's uh, linked to the dialectic question as well. Because in a way, what uh, Henry was saying, so the dialectic not making explicit as a methodological category, but study through forms of contradictions is something that basically leads to the study of crisis, if you want. So if you want to study, I mean, crisis also sometimes is, are produced, most of the time are produced through conflict. So I think one of the, the reasons that Marxist political economy or Marxist methodology can actually own is the fact that we make explicit that there are, you know, no tendency to, sorry, equilibrium or linear uh, tendencies to convergences, but the constant unevenness and conflictual relationship between parts and structures. So um, I think one that, I mean, I, I haven't, uh, explore the methodological understanding of crisis, but I think contradictions and conflict are something peculiar and distinct of this exercise. Uh, and yeah, and obviously dynamic in an historical uh, contingencies that we are living. Done. Thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, <laughs> people keep on asking for, to, to, to get a chance to say something. Uh, Rahul, very, very briefly, and then that will be the, the final contribution before uh, Alessandra. So, sorry, that was a mistake. I'm sorry. Okay, fine. Uh, over to you, Alessandra. Uh, thank you. I just uh, really enjoyed so much this conversation, although I'm exhausted and I, I bet a, a lot of us are as well. I just uh, very briefly want to sort of uh, address uh, Victoria's question because he, he left, uh, uh, he was left hanging there. I actually think the concept of crisis is uh, in a different way central to all chapters because they've been central very much to the type of concerns uh, that uh, Marxist political economy have. So I see uh, your point in asking direction on chapters uh, that are uh, more focused on uh, uh, sort of, uh, for instance, the present crisis. And in that regard, I will uh, uh, address you towards Subir Sina's contribution, although he has uh, left us uh, for the day. Uh, but I would say that, you know, in a sense, uh, you have uh, this, uh, uh, a constant attempt to actually map processes of uh, um, constitution, transgression, and re, uh, reorganization of classes that run through uh, uh, a number of uh, uh, chapters in, in different ways from one that are most obvious that focus, with, uh, focus on uh, class relations uh, in given settings, uh, Ben uh, Farai's uh, et al, uh, um, of course, Satoshi's, uh, but I would say that is something that emerges also from those that do not necessarily uh, uh, focus on, on, on class. Um, I'll just uh, uh, briefly on methods. I, I, I just uh, think it was the most interesting part of the conversation we have today, although it's the most unfulfilled. And I actually am not surprised by it at all, <laughs> because in a sense, it's uh, what the book, uh, uh, well, what many of uh, our contributions uh, grapple with, possibly all, is how you capture power. How you capture power in very different settings. And this has not a, a sort of standardized answer by definition. And at the same time, I'm sorry, Barbara left because she sort of uh, inserted the very telling comment in the chat that one of the reasons why you need to bring Marx in the field is the reason why you also need to re-elaborate it. So, you know, we just uh, 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 enter field-based experiences and sort of with certain categories at the same time, we need to adapt it, transgress them and re-elaborate them and so on and so forth. So there is this sort of um, 
constant, uh, I would say, tension between the categories that we uh, aim at using to explore power at different levels and the fact that uh, these get uh, uh, continuously remade as the process of field-based research uh, uh, goes ahead. And I, I don't think, uh, I think it will be very difficult to get to a final uh, sort of uh, uh, solution or like to a final sort of roadmap, uh, methodological roadmap on this because the ultimate depends on what is it that uh, we are studying and how this process of uh, sort of adaptation, transgression and re-elaboration uh, uh, um, uh, takes place. Uh, and I think perhaps there is also, you know, it's a question that many of us also coming from different disciplines and with different objectives might interpret in very different ways. So for the economist, it's more like which methods you can map out in sort of uh, trying to understand social phenomena as instead for some of us it's like uh, more related to which type of uh, categories are better able to sort of lead you to an understanding that then opens up uh, uh, different forms of, of, of uh, uh, politics. I would just end with what I think we haven't done at all, and uh, but it is in the book instead. That is uh, also the fact that um, I think another interesting line of the book was uh, to sort of queer Marx. And uh, it's in a sense a book that puts together more traditional Marxist as well as more erratic Marxist. I think Henry uh, touched upon that. And I, I think uh, that is, you know, perhaps uh, all, sets of, uh, all different sets of issues on how many of us have combined Marx with different uh, theoretical or methodological traditions. Uh, and I think that is uh, yet another contribution to the book. But I really want to thank all of you for this marathon, as well as the very few that stay with us <laughs> until the end. Um, and yes, I, I see this very much, I saw the book very much as uh, the beginning of a conversation. So indeed, the hope is uh, there are many different uh, books to come, perhaps, well, for sure not edited by me, uh, although I have to say that I put a lot of uh, love and energy in this uh, project. And, you know, um, there's something to be said about uh, online platforms, at least this allowed me to see many of you at the same time, but I still hope uh, I will meet uh, you perhaps in different fora in person uh, very soon. And I'll see some of you uh, later in the um, DSA. Thank you so much. It was just so great to have you all, most all of you in a place. We made it. <laughs> great. Well, I think all, all that's left is to is to give you all a big co congratulations. Yeah, yeah. Well with, done, Alessandra. Yes, yeah. getting putting this together, the con contributing to it, and also taking part in this session. Excellent. Thanks, Jens. Excellent sharing. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. <laughs>